This video is going to explore the wonderful world and exciting world of DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, that is found in every single one of your cells. So first we're going to look at the structure of DNA, who figured it out, so some fun scientists, and how they actually determined it. And then we're going to look at the structure and how it relates to replication and how DNA actually replicates, and some more cool scientists. So a little history lesson, back in 1953, we actually didn't know what DNA was and what was found in our cells. We just knew we were made up of cells. Watson and Crick are two scientists that are pictured on the right that explain the structure. They used some x-ray photos that were taken by Franklin and Wilkins and along with other scientists to put together the idea of the DNA structure. And what they actually found was that there are subunits of DNA which we learned during biochemistry, known as nucleotides. And there are three parts to the nucleotide, deoxyribose, phosphate, and a nitrogen-containing base. So those are the three parts of the nucleotide. And then a whole bunch of nucleotides are strung together and put together in a double-stranded structure. So the middle shows that you have phosphates and sugars on the outside, and then the rungs of the ladder, if you picture that as a ladder, are your nitrogen bases. And then some other scientists said, okay, we know that there are sides and then there's pairing. How are they paired? He looked at the nitrogen base pairing. And what he determined, because there are equal amounts of adenine and thymine, that it would make sense that those paired together. And same with guanine and cytosine. Because they're equal percentages, that means that they should be paired together. So A, or adenine, always pairs with T, or thymine, and G always pairs with C. So the way I think of it is the straight letters with straight letters, and then the curvy letters with the curvy letters. So the nitrogen bases, the reason once he discovered that, he actually looked further into it, they are categorized into two groups. The purines, which have two carbon rings, as shown, are adenine and guanine, and then pyrimidines are the one carbon ring which are the cytosine and thymine, as pictured here. So if you look at that, cytosine does not pair with thymine, but it pairs with guanine, and that is what makes the structure so special. The complementary base pairing. A always pairs with T, with two hydrogen bonds, and G always pairs with C. So you always have, have a three-carbon ring across, so they make the same size structure, therefore it makes sense. Or else, if you think about a ladder, what would happen if all the rungs were different lengths? Some wouldn't work. So therefore, this actually added to Shargoff's idea that A and T always pair together and G and C always pair together. Another aspect of the DNA was the shape and the fact that it's a double helix. It's not actually like a ladder, but it's like a spiral ladder. If you have those spiral staircases in some of the older buildings, that is what your DNA looks like. And each gene, if you remember back to cell division and genetics, has a unique sequence of those bases. So those bases, those nitrogen bases, actually have meaning, and the order of them has meaning. So as I've said, the sides of the ladder are the deoxyribo and phosphates, and then the rungs are the base connecting them, and they are complementary to each other. Another important aspect to look at for the DNA structure are the bonding. And note, it's both covalent and hydrogen, but hydrogen bonds are only found in one location. This is going to be important for replication. They're found between your nitrogen bases. So the sides are hydrogen bonds. The sugar to the base are covalent bonds. So everything's covalent except for the bases. So this is going to be important if we actually need to replicate that those are just the hydrogen bonds. And then the last aspect of the DNA structure are the fact that the chains are anti-parallel, meaning that they run in opposite directions. So if you look at the picture, you have two ends, a 5' prime end, which is the phosphate group, and the 3' prime end, which always ends with the sugar group. This is due to the numbering of the carbons, and so the 5' prime end means that's the fifth carbon sticking out, and the 3' prime end is the third carbon sticking out. But you can name them as the phosphate versus the sugar group. And note they're, the sides are going in opposite direction. So they are what's known as anti-parallel. 
and it is twisted, as seen in the picture. It's not a straight ladder, but a curved, twisted ladder. Now, once they actually figured out the structure, they had to figure out how it replicated. So how DNA replicated was a big question once they figured out the structure, because they know that every cell has DNA, so where does it come from? They came up with three ideas. They were known as semi-conservative, conservative, and dispersive. Now, if you think about experiments and how you go about determining which one was right, you could possibly come up with various experiments. What was actually done was a, an experiment by Messelson and Stahl where they soaked the DNA in a nitrogen-heavy solution. So these are all the pictures of the proposed possibilities. So you have the conservative molecule, which if you, if you look at it, it shows that it's basically photocopying the DNA. So therefore you have your parent cell that has the darker and then your first replication, you have a parent, full parent, and then a new one, and then the second replication, and you get the same thing. Semi-conservative, it's basically the two strands separate and each strand copies. So you'll notice the first replication, you have a parent strand in each and then a new strand in each as well. And then dispersive, you'll see that there's it's all basically random. So you have your parent DNA strand and then your first replicated is just random nucleotides of parent and new put in there all together. So what they actually did was they cultured bacteria in what's known as heavy nitrogen making your heavy DNA. So your parent DNA was all, all what's known as heavy DNA. And then they put it in a light, sol light nitrogen solution and made the bacteria divide. And then if you figured out how heavy the DNA helix is, then you can determine which one was right. Because if you look at the possibilities and findings, if it was a conservative after the first replication, you should have a full heavy and a full light, but they actually didn't find that. So they, after the first replication of the DNA, they discovered the conservative method was wrong because they only ended up with one band of DNA. So it had to be a medium. So if you put light and heavy together, you get a medium. And then they had to replicate it again because dispersive was still up for grabs. They replicated it again and found out that they got two bands. So they got light DNA and the medium DNA, whereas if it was dispersive, they would have still only gotten one and because the, it's randomly dispersed. Semi-conservative was the one that was correct. So they discovered that semi-conservative replication would, was the correct method of replication. Now the next video will discuss the more specifics on how this actually happens, but if you just look at the basic pictures, you would end up with a, you would have a parent strand split down the middle, and then the new strand would be added to each. So you'd end up with two DNA molecules that would be identical to one another, but one parent strand and one daughter strand in each DNA molecule. So that is DNA structure, how they figured it out, and how they figured out how DNA replicates.